The building before us is called Trantor. It is home to 60 billion people and serves as the capital of the Galactic Empire. It stretches down to the ground and functions as a space station where humans reside. It also serves as a star bridge connecting Earth with outer space. Once upon a time, humans lived in a small corner of the galaxy, the solar system, on the third planet revolving around the sun. For over a hundred thousand years, it was not until the first thinking robot was born on Earth that humans quickly gained the technology to terraform alien planets and embarked on interstellar colonization. Humans multiplied and expanded throughout the galaxy, driven by their desire to conquer. They climbed one desolate planet after another, plunging the Milky Way into a long era of interstellar war. It wasn't until the entire galaxy was unified, spanning over 25 million inhabited planets, and covering a territory of a hundred thousand light years, that a colossal empire with trillions of inhabitants rose. The Galactic Empire experienced a subtle turning point after its establishment. Around 12,000 years later, the entire story unfolds from here. The prodigious girl, Gal, was born, and raised on the planet Synax. It is a water world where people haven't developed advanced technology, and rely on primitive fishing and salvage for their livelihood. Religious governance is enforced, and any scientific research is prohibited. Those who study science are considered heretics, and are condemned to be thrown into the depths of the sea. Gal's grandfather died as a result, and she is seen as an outsider by others. She excels in mathematics, and wins the galaxy's largest math competition. As a result, she is given the opportunity to go to Trantor. However, if she doesn't go, she will face extreme punishment. This also means that Gal may never return home. She doesn't know where her destiny will lead her, not even know she will carry the future of the entire galactic empire on her shoulders. After bidding farewell to her family, Gal boards the ship and heads towards the jump ship. Upon arrival at the jump ship, she prepares for the jump. Although she doesn't use the machines, she receives kind reminders from the people around her. Gal truly lives up to being the chosen one. While everyone else is in a state of unconsciousness during the jump, she remains remarkably alert. She gazes at the magnificent view outside the window. When the robots on patrol discovered that Gal's eyes were still open, they immediately administered a hypnotic injection, causing Gal to faint. When she woke up again, the jump ship had already arrived at the center of Trantor. It would take 14 hours to travel from there to the surface. Gal had no idea what awaited her. On the surface, the ruling class of the Empire resided, while ordinary people could only live underground. They worked for the Empire, and would never see the sky, land, or ocean throughout their lives. There was a mathematician named Harry Seldon who pioneered the field of psychohistory. This discipline used mathematical formulas to accurately predict the future of humanity. Prophecy became a trusted science, allowing humans to glimpse into the future. He predicted that the downfall of the Galactic Empire would occur in 500 years with a staggering accuracy of 99. 99%. The ruling clan of the Galactic Empire, the Cleans, consisted of three clones of Cleon I of different ages of different ages, Dewar, David, and Bernie. They chose not to disclose this prophecy to the public because they refused to believe it. Instead, they sought out the prodigious girl, Gal. Let her confirm whether Selden's theory is correct first. If she can prove Selden's theory to be wrong, he will be executed. If Selden's theory is indeed correct, it will cause chaos throughout the Galactic Empire. No need to wait for 500 years. The Empire will fall before the predicted time. Upon arriving at the palace, Gal meets Selden and he hands her a mathematical manuscript. He also displays the Prime Radiant in front of her. After their conversation, the Prime Radiant is also given to Gal as a gift. Selden, who foresaw the Empire's demise and his own death, passes on valuable items to those who will survive is also a form of inheritance. Through the Prime Radiant, Gal can calculate whether Selden's prophecy is correct. Gal imitates Selden's actions and opens the Prime Radiant. By performing calculations twice, she unravels its secrets. Regardless of whether Selden's prophecy is accurate, Gal needs to consider how to answer the Emperor's question. Mathematics doesn't lie. Selden's calculations are correct. If she publicly acknowledges this, he will be charged with treason. Disturbing the public sentiment will destabilize the Empire's fortune. If she answers that the prophecy is incorrect, Selden will be executed, but Gal will be spared. However, when the real crisis comes, nobody will be prepared, and it will accelerate the Empire's downfall. No matter which choice is made, it will lead to the same result. Everyone is waiting for Gal's answer. This is not a question of mathematical correctness or incorrectness, but a question of how to choose between life and death. Gal states that Selden's prophecy is correct. The Emperor orders the execution of both of them. At that moment, the impact of the space station explosion reaches the surface. The entire star bridge crashes down, embedding itself 55 levels deep into the ground. The death toll exceeds 1 billion in an instant. Just 10 hours prior, a soldier arrived at the Trantor space station and detonated a subcutaneous nanolace explosive. 
Such a suicide attack was unpredictable, the Emperor now directs all his anger towards Selden, questioning why he had the foresight but didn't report it, therefore, he must be the mastermind. Selden explains that mathematical predictions are based on collective behavior, and individual differences cannot be foreseen. The peripheral galaxies have always opposed the Empire's tyranny, and an attack was only a matter of time. Gaal timely chimes in, stating that killing them would only accelerate the Empire's demise, and one could even argue that the prophecy would come true within a year. The Emperor finds this reasoning reasonable, and rescinds the order to execute them. Instead, they will be exiled to Terminus, the marginal planet of the Galactic Empire. They will be tasked with researching ways to save the Galactic Empire, and they will not be allowed to use jump ships, but instead rely on regular interstellar travel. It would take around 900 days for the long interstellar journey. During the arduous space travel, in order to alleviate their loneliness, Gaal and Selden's apprentice, Jack, quickly developed a romantic relationship, and she became pregnant. Space is filled with radiation, and not suitable for nurturing life therefore, they decided to preserve the embryo, and let it develop after landing on Terminus. The environment on Terminus is harsh, and survival is difficult. They are conducting landing simulations on the spacecraft to test how to evade attacks from the Bishop's Claw, the biggest threat on Terminus. No matter how they simulate and practice, they cannot find a way to survive. They either get eaten by the Bishop's Claw or get killed by their own weapons. This also undermines Selden's confidence. The survival rate within six years of landing on Terminus is only 65%. If things continue like this, the entire Foundation will be wiped out before it even gets established. This interstellar journey is not an escape but a journey to death. There is no guarantee of survival for the Foundation personnel. Selden continues to calculate various data in search of hope, but it seems futile. One day, during a meal, Selden mocked Jack, which left everyone present feeling awkward. Unexpectedly, something happened that night. Jack killed Selden. When Gal arrived and witnessed everything, Jack pushed her into the cryogenic sleep chamber, and left a dagger for her. Then he exiled the spaceship into the vast universe. Shortly after this incident, Selden's spaceship arrived at Terminus. Although he was no longer alive, his landing plan was flawless. People just needed to follow the plan, and the foundation would be established immediately. Yet, people discovered a mysterious object standing naturally on Terminus. It hovered in the air, emitting a null field that prevented anyone from approaching. Entering its null field would cause fainting but not death. People named it the Vault, and established the foundation outside its null field. They gradually adapted to the climate and survived there. Meanwhile, after Dr. Selden's departure, Bernie demanded to find the perpetrator of the suicide attack. They repeatedly watched the footage of the perpetrator detonating the subcutaneous nanolace explosive, and discovered that the poem they recited was in the language of the spin and the planet Anacreon. As a result, they blamed these two planets for all the blame. The next day, the delegations from the two planets, the Spin and Anacreon, were executed in Trantor. Only two ambassadors were left to witness the Emperor's punishment on their home planets. Countless laser missiles were launched towards the planets Anacreon and the Spin. It can be said that the two planets were left in ruins, and only a few people survived. Although the ambassadors were heartbroken, they had no power to reverse the situation. David is using this as a deterrent against the ambitions of the peripheral galaxies. The so-called strategy of knocking the mountain to frighten the tiger is just a performance of being strong on the outside but weak on the inside. This massacre will only accelerate the downfall of the Galactic Empire. Bernie's mission is about to be accomplished. He will become the Dark Emperor. In his final moments, he wants to take one last look at the entirety of Trantor, this space station that rapidly rose under his leadership. At this moment, there are 130,000 bodies floating in space. Part of the star bridge is already buried deep underground, while its wreckage still extends on the surface. This symbol that once represented the glory of the Empire, has become completely useless and occupies space. Only by completely destroying it can a new glory be established. Under the watchful eyes of three generations of the Cleon family, the star bridge is destroyed. Instantly, it disintegrates into countless fragments scattered in the universe. This signifies the arrival of a new power transition for the Cleon family. David becomes Bernie. Dewar ascends to become David and a new Dewar is cloned. He witnesses the new history with his own eyes. Years later, on Terminus, a group of children see approaching the vault as a symbol of bravery. They slowly approach it, planting their own little flags. Some children, despite not believing in superstitions, insist on entering the null field. They all lose consciousness and wait for their friend's rescue. As a result, the vault becomes synonymous with something ominous. But there is one little girl named Salva, who is the keeper of records. She finds the vault beautiful and can even see some inexplicable images when she gets close to it. Moreover, Salva has never told anyone that she is immune to the null field of the vault. She can approach the vault without fainting, even from an infinite distance. Every day, she tests the range of the null field with a small animal, and discovers that it is gradually expanding, if left unchecked. 
the expansion of the null field will eventually cover the foundation, which is very dangerous. Salva is a guardian of the foundation. After everyone goes to sleep, she is responsible for guarding the foundation. On this day, she sees a new spaceship approaching, belonging to the Anacrian people. She immediately reports the situation to the management, and everyone gathers for a meeting to come up with a response plan. Some suggest contacting the Trantor Center for support, while others say the intentions of the newcomers should be confirmed before notifying anyone. But no matter what, the defense mechanisms must be activated first, as it will take time for rescue from Trantor to arrive. Everyone equips themselves with weapons for defense. Two bad news spread. The weapons have been in disrepair over the years and are now broken, and the signal to contact the Trantor Center shows a failure. It never rains but it pours. Salva takes the binoculars to observe the enemy's situation, and unexpectedly sees a child running towards the vault. She immediately follows, and arrives at an abandoned spaceship, where she sees a wounded bishop's claw. She instantly feels the danger approaching, and indeed, the skilled Anacreon hunter, Andy, is waiting there with his bow and arrow. She asks Salva to take her inside the protective barrier of the Foundation to find the spaceship's navigation module. This barrier is designed to target Outlander from Terminus, so Salva can freely enter and exit. Andy sticks close to her back and they enter together, but she can only bring her alone. The two of them board a spacecraft and head towards the Foundation. However, Salva knows well that the null field of the vault will affect Andy, so she flies towards the vault. As expected, Andy faints along the way. Salva ties her back to the Foundation and interrogates her about why she wants the navigation module, and if it's her sole objective. Andy evades the question and refuses to tell the truth. At this moment, the Anacreon army surrounds the Foundation, waiting outside the barrier, as both sides remain deadlocked. A jumpship suddenly appears in the sky. It is the support sent by the Trantor Center. Salva feels relieved, thinking help has arrived, but Andy wears a satisfied expression. Her objective has been achieved. Her soldiers release interference signals, preventing Salva from communicating with the jump ship. Andy is taken to the control center, and throws a bomb. The barrier of the foundation instantly disappears, and the outer Anacreon forces launch an attack. This is Andy's perfect plan. On the other side, young Dua has grown up, and discovered the secret of his origins. He couldn't accept it at once, and wanted to end his own life. Just as he leaped towards the ground, an invisible force lifted him up, and gently placed him back on the ground. Dua was unharmed. The gardener, Azura, watched this scene in shock, and dropped the flower pot, running away. Seeing this, Dua couldn't proceed with his suicide plan, and instead instructed his butler to investigate Azura's background. Dua's desire to end his life was not due to weakness, but because he discovered that he belonged to inferior genes. The Cleon family does not tolerate defective product. If a clone emperor has a problem, there are millions of other clones to replace him, as they strive to maintain genetic purity, in order to ensure the genetic integrity of the imperial family bloodline. Defective individuals have no human rights and are executed directly. Dua discovered his own issue, and wanted to end his life prematurely, but unexpectedly, he met Azura. After learning that Azura had a clean background, a sudden romantic plot appeared in the movie. The two of them confided in each other, with the boy having power, influence, looks, and wealth. While the girl was gentle, understanding, and empathetic, they freely entered Dua's bedroom, and were intimate at the Imperial Family Museum. Dua even accompanied Azura outside the palace, experiencing the lives of common people. Azura knew that Dua was colorblind, and she gave him corrective glasses as a gift. Their relationship quickly intensified. Dua revealed his secret about his origins to Azura, and expressed his desire to escape. Since being an emperor would result in his execution, he believed it would be better to start a new life as a commoner. So, he and Azura began planning an escape route, and tested it numerous times with electronic surveillance. Finally, they managed to escape from the palace, just as Dua thought he could start a brand new life. Azura aimed a gun at him. That's right, everything was a trap. The blame lay with Dua's naivety, believing everything he was told. Love struck mind is not advisable. Azura was actually a member of the rebellion. Dua was tied to a chair, and listened to the plans of his beloved. They wanted to use their own people to replace Dua, and return to the palace. This would not only mess up the emperor's bloodline, but also subvert the empire at a crucial moment. The manipulation of the emperor's genetic plan had started long ago. Dua's weakness accelerated their plan's implementation. On one side, Azura was impassioned, but in the next moment, the rebels were all killed. Bernie had foreseen it all. He had already discovered that Azura had ill intentions, and deliberately let her achieve her desires, in order to expose the rebel headquarters location. This time, wiping them out was as easy as pie. But what to do with Dua? David and Bernie had differing opinions. It seems that even with the same genes, after experiencing different events, different personalities are formed, resulting in different perspectives on a matter, which can lead to a big fight. Dua witnessed the two of them fighting each other, 
and scared, he sought refuge in the arms of a robot, thinking it was the safest place. Little did he know that in the next moment, he would receive a fatal blow. After Jura died, David made the final judgment on Azura. He killed everyone Azura knew, erasing any traces of her existence, and leaving her alive, turning her into a vegetative state, devoid of all sensation, until her eventual demise due to depression. This was revenge for the harm she inflicted on Dua. Although Dua died, his death was not an exception. After the investigation, it was discovered that Azura's rebel organization, not only wanted to tamper with Dua's genes, but had also made manipulations on the original Klian Emperor. So, all the clones of the first emperor became defective products, and David seems to feel a sense of relief at this point, as he had been troubled by whether he had an independent personality. These slight foreign genes happen to contribute to his self-awareness awakening. He is not just a puppet parasitized by genes. The Cleon family storyline ends here. Now let's look at the team of pioneers in Terminus. The barrier protection has been revoked, and Andy's army is besieging them. Salva wants to verify the authenticity of Andy's words. Andy says that 30 years ago, the Emperor ordered an attack on her home planet, Anacreon, and in an instant, they lost almost all their family members. Since then, she has gathered the power from all the planets, and swore to seek revenge against the Empire. The planet has become uninhabitable, and lacks technological development due to the attacks. That's why they came to Terminus, a fringe planet not under Imperial surveillance. They want to establish a settlement and take root here. Originally, with the technological capabilities of their own planet, they had no way to resist the Empire. But unexpectedly, they were exiled here with the troops led by Selden. Now even the jump ships have arrived. Andy has taken hostage all the engineers capable of operating the warships, and arrived in front of an abandoned warship Invictus. Andy plans to turn this warship into a bomb, and directly destroy Trantor. Now, everyone needs to board the Invictus, where even a slight mistake could lead to drifting in the vast universe. Everyone landed safely, except Hugo, Salva's boyfriend, who failed. He appeared to be lost in space, but in reality, he was trying to escape from the enemy's sight, so that he could go and deliver the message. The rest of the group boarded the ship, and unexpectedly triggered the defense system. A barrage of bullets was fired, and everyone sought cover to avoid being hit. In a critical moment, an engineer opened the cabin door, stopping the attack, but what they saw in front of them left everyone stunned. The bodies of crew members were floating around. It turned out that they had just lost pressure, and suffocated inside the cabin. In order to use the Invictus, they had to repair the pressurization system and restore the oxygen supply. After successfully entering the ship's body, the engineer discovered that their arrival had triggered the jump system of the Invictus. Two hours later, the jump program started, and if they didn't provide a fixed coordinate, the jump ship would randomly select a location. If it chose a remote outer region, it would be difficult to return. At this moment, Salva prepared for the jump, and Andy wanted to go to Trantor. Salva couldn't ignore it, so she took the opportunity to pick up a handgun from the ground and fight back. Andy's reinforcements were constantly arriving at the outer perimeter of the warship. Just as both sides were shooting at each other, the jump program started. Everyone passed out due to external forces. Remember, Salva was not affected by the vault, nor was she affected by the jump. She didn't faint and remained conscious and capable of acting freely. Salva tied up everyone, regaining control. However, she didn't know where the jump would lead them. When she could see clearly that the planet outside was Terminus, she discovered that the engineer had died in the operating chair. It was he who had brought everyone back to Terminus. But no matter how Salva called for ground personnel, no one responded. When she saw the beggar from Proxima, she jumped on board to re-establish contact with the ground, but still received no response. What exactly happened on Terminus? While she was puzzled and confused, unidentified creatures began to collide with the spaceship from outside. Upon closer inspection, it turned out to be Hugo. Now there was someone to help. Salva decided to return to the ground to investigate the situation, leaving Hugo on the jump ship to prevent a second jump, and asked him to contact the The Spins to come to Terminus, to join forces against the Anacreans. When Salva returned to the ground, she found that everyone had fainted. It was evident that the Null Field Vault had expanded, and covered the entire foundation. Salva tried to manipulate the Prime Radiant, imagining the hallucinatory scenes that had appeared before, and truly found a solution to the Prime Radiant. Soon, she followed the instructions from the scenes and operated accordingly. The vault is slowly undergoing changes. It sheds its black shell and gently descends to the ground. Then, it splits in two like a blooming flower. While the people in the foundation gradually wake up, two of the spin warships land on the ground, and they threaten the Anacreon soldiers with their weapons, who obediently surrender. Both sides are about to negotiate. When a spaceship quickly approaches from the sky, it is Andy, hijacking the The Spin ship, and begins firing at the ground. The previously advantaged The Spins are once again defeated. The people from these two planets, have a deep-rooted feud, much like the families of Romeo and Juliet. 
It has lasted so long that no one knows where the initial conflict and differences arose. As soon as they meet, they are ready to engage in battle. Salva mediates between them, believing that everyone should cooperate and work together to repair the jump ship. Andy certainly doesn't agree, as she currently holds the upper hand. At this moment, the vault emits a beam of light. All attention turned to the vault. Seizing the opportunity, Salva shot an arrow, ending Andy's life. Then, slowly emerging from the vault, a man appeared, and it was Selden. He appeared unharmed, despite being supposedly killed by Jack. Now, let's go back to Gal, who is wandering. According to the specific procedures of the spaceship, she arrived in a larger ship. No matter how she called for someone, no one responded. The only tool she had in her hand was Jack's dagger. As soon as she took it out, it automatically adhered to the door. The door opened, and she proceeded to examine the ship's flight data. She discovered that she had been drifting in space for 35 years, and she was the only person on this ship. Gal checked the news to find out what had happened after she left. The result was that Selden was stabbed to death. Jack was executed, and Gal was wanted as an accomplice. She couldn't accept the reality, and she felt that she had no one to rely on in the entire galaxy. She contemplated ending her own life, when a mystical revelation appeared. The ship decelerated, causing Gal to fall to the ground. As a result, she had an epiphany. Isn't it amazing? She understood that death doesn't solve any problems. In this way, she was revitalized and regained her composure. She wanted to uncover the truth behind all this. First, she needed to determine her current location. So, she analyzed a series of data such as star coordinates, directions, and angles. While she was nervously calculating, suddenly there was a patch of blood on the ground. This was illogical since there was no one else on the spaceship. She slowly approached the bloodstain, only to see Selden lying on the ground. She hurriedly went to help, but couldn't touch anything. It wasn't Selden's physical body, but a projection of his consciousness. He could answer all her questions. This ship was specifically prepared for Jack. After killing Selden, he could escape here. Originally, Gal was supposed to appear on Terminus, leading the Foundation personnel in the planet's reconstruction efforts and becoming the leader. As for Selden, as the only obstacle to this plan, he had to die. His survival was an accident. In all the calculations for the successful establishment of the Foundation, the premise was that he was already dead. To adhere to this principle, he had Jack kill him, preserving the hope for the establishment of the base. The climate and environment on Terminus were harsh and abnormal. The only way for everyone to survive was to hold on to hope. If everyone knew that Selden had no solution to the current situation, that would undoubtedly kill everyone's hope. Regardless, Selden had to die. He was willing to sacrifice himself for the establishment of the Foundation. However, the current situation was not within Selden's expectations. He invited Gal to accompany him to another Foundation, where there was new hope. Gal couldn't accept being deceived, so she refuted Selden. In a fit of anger, she entered the hibernation chamber, and continued her journey of wandering in space. Meanwhile, Selden had already developed self-replicating molecular machines. He consumed them before his death, following the setting. After the coffin was launched into outer space, the machines began to break down his bodily tissues, and, through the process of regenerative technology, formed the vault. It served as both his tombstone and his physical embodiment. That's why everyone could see Selden again. Salva approached and asked, Will you always watch over the Foundation? Selden replied that he would only appear when a crisis emerged. Now, with the, the spins and the Anacreans gathered here, it was considered a crisis, and that's why he appeared. He completely forgot that it was Salva who decoded the Prime Radiant and awakened him. Selden revealed the reason why people from the two planets became archenemies. Over 300 years ago, the King of the Spin married the Great Hunter from Anacreon. This union formed an alliance among emerging powers in the outer regions. However, on their wedding night, the king inexplicably killed the hunter, triggering animosity and conflict between the two planets. This enmity has endured for generations, continuing until the present day. Yet, no one has analyzed how this irrational event unfolded. They never considered that the mastermind behind it all was the emperor of the Galactic Empire. The alliance between the two peripheral planets would undoubtedly make both sides stronger, posing a threat to the Galactic Empire's power. To ensure his own reign was not jeopardized, they dispatched shadow assassins to kill the bride and frame the king. This led to the dissolution of the alliance between the two planets, allowing Emperor to reap the benefits without lifting a finger. It is evident that the scheming of the Galactic Emperor are sinister, while the people of the two planets directed their anger towards each other. Indeed, it was highly unwise, they couldn't even see who their true enemy was. Now, everyone should set aside their hatred, and work towards becoming stronger. Together, they can build Terminus, and create a new home base on the Foundation. With Selden's technology and spaceship, as well as a warship Invictus, given enough time, it could even overthrow the rule of the Empire. Currently, Terminus is still lacking in power, 
but it can unite with the forces of the outer regions, to develop and grow stronger, like the story of the foolish old man moving mountains, it will benefit future generations, now, as long as everyone remains united, this place will become the new terminus, it will no longer be a small planet of the galactic empire, but a great planet for all of you, since the galactic empire is destined to fall, why not hasten its demise, it turns out Selden's prophecy was true, the galactic empire will indeed be destroyed, Yet, coming to Terminus and establishing the Foundation, was not about preserving hope for the continuation of the Empire, it was about building a rebel alliance to accelerate the prophecy's success, but someone raised the question of what to do about the surveillance warships sent by the Empire, Selden had already thought of a solution, through the use of a quantum drive, they could create the illusion of a solar flare, the flare would kill all life within the stellar system, making it appear that Terminus, where the Foundation is located, has been destroyed, the Empire will no longer send surveillance patrol ships to investigate. Therefore, everyone can focus on developing their own technology and accumulating enough power. The people are filled with joy and determination. Selden's speech comes to an end, and he wishes to retire and return to Trantor. At this moment, Salva catches up and asks if the illusions in her mind were created by Selden. He denies any involvement. Next, everyone joins forces to create the civilization of Terminus, waiting for an opportunity to confront the Empire. While Salva feels troubled, she is disturbed by her own illusions, unable to find their source, her mother notices her distress, and reveals everything, it turns out that she is Gaal's child, remember the preserved embryo, after they arrived at Terminus, her mother nurtured the embryo into a person, thus, Salva came into existence, but according to genetic theory, Salva's mother is Gaal, the illusions she often sees are actually Gaal's experiences, while it is unknown about Gaal's location, Salva finds a new purpose, to search for her mother, no matter where she may be, time flashes by, after arriving 138 years later, Gaal's spaceship landed on the water surface of her hometown, Synax, it had been engulfed by floods, leaving only a few floating grass huts, Gaal felt a profound sense of loneliness in her heart, she couldn't regain her composure for a long time, suddenly, she noticed a glimmer in the water, without hesitation, she jumped into the water, to her surprise, she discovered a sunken spaceship, Gaal pulled the person inside the spaceship out of the water, in the darkness of the night, that person woke up, it was Salva, she had been asleep for over 100 years, when she opened her eyes, and saw the person in front of her, identical to the one in her illusions, she realized that she had finally reunited with her mother in their hometown, season 1 comes to an end, it is adapted from Isaac Asimov's science fiction novels, the show is produced by Apple TV, and features breathtaking and grand visuals, while fans of the original work expressed their protests, wanting the writing team to stick closer to the original story, don't make too many changes from the book, the three main storylines of the series are not exactly synchronized in time but rather tell their own narratives, the imperial storyline has received positive feedback from viewers, although some find the romantic subplot inexplicable, Gaal's storyline, on the other hand, has limited screen time, as you start to grasp the basic narrative framework of the foundation, and identify who is who, the timeline abruptly shifts to the next generation, opening up the new Terminus storyline, the show's strong emphasis on political correctness has lowered expectations for the second season, that concludes today's video, we'll see you in the next film.